The next five findings focus on system level issues. These deficiencies stem from overall complexity, lapses in accountability, to identifying weaknesses with the resource allocation model. Also, per the direction of the evaluation's charge, this section also explores alternative models for distributing resources for K-12 public education. <clears throat> Finding eight, the allotment system is opaque, overly complex, and difficult to comprehend, which results in limited transparency. A characteristic complex systems share is that there typically contains numerous complicated elements that interact with one another. The allotment system demonstrates these characteristics. LEA business officers are ultimately responsible for not only understanding the complexity of the allotment system and its formulas, but also determining how to optimize the use of resources distributed through the allotments. Complexity must be managed by the business officer or charter school operations staff. Learning to do so takes time. We surveyed all LEA business officers to gain an understanding of just how challenging learning to navigate the allotment system can be. Less than 1% believe learning the system can be done within a year. Nearly a quarter of respondents believed it took four or more years to learn how to navigate and maximize the use of the allotment system. Now this is worrisome because 23% of LEA business officers have less than four years experience. To help LEAs navigate the complexity, many have resorted to using consultants more than 30% of LEAs reported using a consultant within the last five years. We estimate this cost LEAs at least $1.5 million. Now this complexity can work to the advantage or disadvantage of LEAs. We discovered that business officers' ability to navigate the allotment system can determine the amount of resources the LEA receives. We met with one LEA to change the way it used the position allotments. This strategic use of position allotments allowed that LEA to hire 20 additional teachers. However, we also found one LEA whose conversions of positions to dollars cost that LEA an estimated 2.4 million in state resources. We understand that some level of complexity is going to be inherent in any system the state uses to distribute resources for K-12 education. However, if LEAs are forced to spend limited resources on consultants because the amount that they receive is dependent on their ability to navigate the complexity, we really have to question whether the current allotment system is in the best interest of the state and ultimately the children. Problems with complexity and transparency are exacerbated by a patchwork of laws, documented policies and procedures that seek to explain the system. To begin, the framework for the system is based on piecemeal changes made through budgetary provisions, session laws, and agency policy. This can be problematic because policies and procedures are insufficient. The policy manual is only available retrospectively. We began our field work for this evaluation earlier this year in February. We requested a copy of the allotment policy manual. We were given a set of policies from 2013-14. This wasn't too helpful considering two budget cycles had already passed and had marshaled in several changes to how the allotments work. Furthermore, the policy manual does not comprehensively cover all the allotments and lacks specific procedural detail. All this creates challenges in not only validating the allotments, but understanding how the thing as a whole works. Finding 10, allotment transfers, which is, which within the system is intended to promote LEA flexibility, hinders accountability for resources targeted at disadvantaged, at risk, and limited English proficiency students. A common criticism of a resource allocation model, such as the system we use in our state, is the lack of adaptability with regard to how resources are allocated and expended. This adaptability is further stymied by the perception that resources allocated by component or category must be or should be expended 
on related items. To counteract this concern, North Carolina has built in flexibility to the allotment system through the use of transfers. In fiscal year 1415, there were a total of 968 transfers that were made that equaled $203 million. Transfers Mr. provide. Mr. Hamill, let me just say welcome to your tardiness. <laughs> Thank you. you may. <laughs> Transfers provide flexibility to LEAs by ensuring resources can be redirected and expended as needed. However, under some allotment types, transfers can blur accountability. The graphic on the next slide will demonstrate how. The state provides supplemental funding for at-risk, disadvantaged, and LEP populations through three different allotments. Each of these allotments contains spending provisions that are in place to ensure resources targeted at these students are being used to serve these students. In total, in fiscal year 14-15, LEAs transferred $11.3 million away from at-risk, disadvantaged, and LEP students into the allotment for non-instructional support. What years? 1415. The graphic shows the, restri the restrictions placed on the use of funds for these students are not aligned with the purpose and use of resources for non-instructional support. Funds for at-risk, disadvantaged, and LEP students are intended to be spent on programs to help these students bridge achievement gaps and reduce the number of dropouts. The result of these transfers is that these funds are now being used by LEAs to procure personnel whose duties may only be peripherally related, if at all, to achieving the original intent of these funds. These, tra these transfers ultimately act to circumvent the restrictions that are placed on these allotments in law and in policy. Finding 11, translating the allotment system for funding LEAs into a method for funding per pupil, into a method for providing per pupil funding to charter schools creates several challenges. Unlike LEAs that receive funding through multiple allotments that reflect funding for components and programs that make up the basic education delivery model, charter schools receive funding on a per pupil basis. This amount, which is different for each LEA, must be translated from the allotments the LEAs receive. DPI uses each of the allotments listed on the slide to come up with a per pupil amount. Essentially, each allotment is divided by the number of students in membership or the respective headcount to come up with the per pupil amount. However, the translation is not always as clean as it appears on the slide. Several allotments translate poorly. Here's a couple of examples. To begin, the amount of per pupil funding that a charter school receives sometimes includes a portion of small county supplemental funding that the state provides to certain county LEAs. Small county funding, recall, is intended to provide supplemental funds to county LEAs with fewer than 3,200 students. Two charter schools operate within one of the LEAs that receive this funding, and therefore the charter school also receives small county supplemental funding as part of their per pupil amount. We estimate the amount small county funds that those two charter schools received was 1.4 million. Now it's possible that those two charter schools suffer from diseconomies of scale of the sort that small county funding allotment is intended to alleviate. However, those diseconomies of scale are related to charter school size and not the LEA size. The transportation allotment provides another example of a flawed translation. See, charter schools are not obligated to provide transportation for students. We found an estimated 49% of charter schools do not provide transportation for their students. However, all charter schools receive a per pupil portion of funding from the transportation allotment. As a result, almost half of the charter schools receive funding intended to support a service they don't provide. In addition to some allotments translating poorly, the method for determining funded ADM 
for LEAs and charters differs, which can result in decreased funding for charter schools. Let's walk through the graphic below on the slide to show you how the method used for charter schools can underestimate a charter's ADM. Now just for sake of clean numbers, let's consider a charter school with 100 fifth grade students. Now in that first week, for whatever reason, only 75 showed up for class. The remaining three weeks, all 100 showed up for class. But because roles were short in that first week, the charter will only get credit or funded ADM of 94 students in that fifth grade. This ultimately means six students went unfunded. We estimate, had the method been similar to the way DPI calculates funded ADM for the LEAs, where there's a second month of attendance observed, charters would have been due an additional 2.3 million in state funds. Our final finding, finding 12. Now recall, the work plan specifically directed this evaluation to consider the feasibility of implementing student-based allotment system. With regard to the specific direction, we found that using a weighted student formula is indeed feasible and offers some advantages over the present system, but would require time and careful consideration. Recall, the state uses a resource allocation model instead of a weighted student formula. Only seven states still rely on a resource allocation model. The majority of states now provide funding through some type of weighted student formula. Now that we can establish that we're in the minority of states that rely on the resource allocation model, let's walk through what a weighted student formula is and how it works. Weighted student formula represents an approach to school finance that uses the individual student as the building blocks for developing the state's education budget and distributing resources. In a weighted student formula, students, rather than positions, districts, or schools, serve as the starting point for education finance. It starts with a base dollar amount that is provided for each student that is intended to cover the cost of educating the general student. Weighted categories are then established to provide additional funding for certain student characteristics. The weighted student count is then multiplied by the base amount per student to determine total funding. Funding is then distributed to districts or charter schools in the form of dollars rather than positions. The fourth handout shows how a weighted student model is conceptualized and operationalized. But before I walk you through this graphic on this slide and the next, it's important to mention that the values used in this table and in the next slide are for illustrative purposes only and are purely hypothetical. The fourth handout can also be found as Exhibit 25, and I think it's on page 56 of the full report. Let's take a look at the two core components more closely. First is the base which is intended to cover the cost of educating a general student. Then there are weights. Weighted funding is intended to provide additional funds based on student or district characteristics. First, the base amount must be determined. In this graphic, it's derived from the cost of a basic education for a high school student. The base is typically anchored to the least costly grade ranges. Then, policy decision must be made with regard to weights. Weighted factors may pertain to a student with disabilities, disadvantaged students, students with limited English proficiency, or other identified categories. Some states even vary funding weights based upon grades, as the cost of grade, or as the cost to educate children through different grades may vary. Let's take a look at how this might be operationalized. This graphic I'll walk you through on the slide demonstrates how a weighted student formula works. The first example shows a general 10th grade student. Now based upon the table in this handout, the student would only generate the base amount of funding. The next example shows a second grade student with a learning disability. This student generates the base plus a weight for being a K through three student. The student also generates additional funding for their learning disability. And the base and weights together 
and the LEA would receive more than 16000 to support the education for that child. The last example shows a middle school student that is classified as at risk and limited English proficiency. Again, funding for this student starts with the base. There is a weight for the grade level. There is a weight, there is a weighted funding amount for limited English proficiency. And lastly, there is an amount for being classified as at risk. All told, the LEA would receive just shy of 15,000 to support the education for that child. What's different about this is that LEAs receive dollars in lieu of positions. Funding is targeted at the student as opposed to funding that focuses on the school business enterprise and the components of the state education delivery model. It's easy to see how a model like this is better suited to settings where there are multiple education platforms such as charter or virtual schools. This would also ensure that funding would no longer need to be translated from the current system into a per pupil amount for charter schools. Now transitioning to a weighted student formula would provide a number of potential benefits. First is adaptability. Under a weighted student formula, state resources are provided to LEAs or charter schools on the basis of individual students. This makes the funding system more adaptable to different, differing education delivery models such as distance learning, dual enrollment programs, open enrollment, and other emerging types of publicly funded education. There's also gained efficiency. Weighted student formulas are adjusted as enrollment changes, and therefore districts are forced to adapt to the needs of the current population and provide services accordingly. <coughs> Lastly, it improves transparency. Weighted student formulas are simpler to understand because funding is determined through one formula with weights rather than a multitude of different formulas, each with their own eligibility criteria, distribution formula, restrictions, and special provisions. Lastly, through a weighted student formula, the amount an LEA would receive would not be dependent on the ability of a business officer to navigate the complexity of a funding system. While there are certainly benefits of using a weighted student formula, there are several points of caution. Several findings in this report describe challenges regarding how resources are distributed throughout North Carolina's existing allotment system that are related to policy decisions. A weighted student formula model has the potential to address issues related to complexity, transparency, and the reliance on the ability of LEA personnel and the adaptability of the system. However, there are several other challenges unrelated to the system itself that involve specific policies that a weighted student model does not address. In addition, depending on how a weighted student formula is implemented, the General Assembly may end up shifting more control to the local level through fewer mandates and restrictions. But again, this would depend upon what types of mandates or restrictions would be carried over into a new finance model. Lastly, there is no one model that can be adopted from other states. We reached out to experts in the field of school finance for recommendations of other state models. We were told to look at states like California, Georgia, and Maryland. And what became very clear is there is no one model. A review of these states showed the implementation of weighted student formulas happens very differently. Therefore, design would take time and require careful consideration by this body to ensure the new distribution model meets the state's public education needs and policy objectives. We're getting there. Based on those 12 findings, we have two options made up of five recommendations. Given the current state of the allotment system, the General Assembly has two options. The first is to overhaul the model for how resources are distributed by developing a plan to implement an allotment system based upon a weighted student funding model or reform the current allotment system. Recommendation one provides direction on the first option, whereas recommendation two 
3, and 4 provide directions for the second option. Recommendation 5 deals with how funded ADM for charter schools should be determined and can be, can be considered independent of other recommendations. Recommendation 1. If the General Assembly determines it's in the state's interest to simplify the funding system and distribute resources on a per student basis, it should establish a task force with overhauling the allotment system. The task force would be responsible for designing the weighted student formula, which includes determining the base amount distributed on a per student basis to cover the cost of educating a general student. Be responsible for determining the student characteristics that are eligible for weighted student funding and the associated weights of each of these characteristics and how the base amount would be augmented by LEA characteristics such as wealth and size. In addition, the task force would also determine which funding elements would remain outside of the base and weighted amounts. For example, states that have implemented a weighted student formula typically leave resources for transportation and capital outlay outside of these formulas. The task force would also be responsible for creating a working draft of the formula that analyzes the impact of funding on LEAs and charter schools. The task force should be made up of 18 members with equal representation of the House and Senate. The two, the two chairs should be given discretion to, to determine if outside consultation is necessary to aid in the design of the weighted student funding model. Should the, task, should, the chair, should the task force chairs determine the need for independent consultation or professional facilitation, the General Assembly should appropriate funds sufficient to meet this requirement. Now, should the General Assembly decide it's satisfied with the use of the current resource allocation model, Recommendations two, two through four serve as measures that should be considered, two through five should be considered to reform the current system. This begins with recommendation two. The General Assembly should codify the state allotment system and statute and direct DPI to maintain and make publicly available a comprehensive, relevant, and up-to-date set of policies and procedures that document the entire allotment system. Recommendation three, the General Assembly should address the individual allotment deficiencies identified in findings one through seven of this report. To improve the distribution of resources for classroom teachers, the General Assembly should consider allotting dollars instead of positions and broadening the teacher compensation model. The amount provided for teachers should be based upon the number of eligible teachers and an average classroom teacher state salary across LEAs. Under this approach, each LEA would receive a lump sum to cover the cost of classroom teacher salaries and benefits. Given there is currently a pilot that explores compensation based upon teaching roles and performance, the General Assembly should continue to monitor its implementation. To ensure appropriate oversight of this pilot, the General Assembly should consider modifying the reporting requirement from annually to biannually. Related to children with disabilities, the General Assembly should direct DPI to establish a framework that differentiates funding based on service setting and consider eliminating or restructuring the funding cap. With LEP funding, the General Assembly should consider eliminating the minimum funding threshold and, and cap and provide a graduated per headcount amount for LEP students that observes economies of scale. With regard to the small county allotment, the General Assembly should modify the thresholds to be more consistent with evidentiary education cost function literature and eliminate the use of base funds from other allotments. Making the threshold more consistent with literature would result in an annual cost avoidance of $22.5 million that could be redistributed through other allotments. Finding five, show that low wealth formula relies on a factor that does not accurately assess the county's ability to generate local funding. The General Assembly should take action to eliminate the use of the adjusted property tax per square mile factor and provide equal weighting for a county's anticipated revenue per ADM 
and the county's average per capita. This would ensure that the formula more precisely describes a county's ability to generate local revenue to support education. With regard to disadvantaged student supplemental funding, the General Assembly should eliminate the hold harmless provision. This would free up an estimated 18 million in additional resources that again could be redistributed across all LEAs through either the disadvantaged student supplemental funding allotment or other allotments. Lastly, the General Assembly should return to distributing central office administration dollars based on student membership. Funding on a per student basis should reflect the prior structure that followed a tiered or stepwise distribution configuration. Recommendation four. Remember that finding 10 established the importance of funding for at-risk, disadvantaged, and LEP population students. However, this finding also showed that more than $11 million of these funds for these special populations had been diverted away and placed in an allotment designed to provide resources for non-instructional support. To ensure allotments for special populations are expended on instructional items, the General Assembly should prohibit LEAs from transferring funds into non-instructional support from allotments designed to provide instruction for special populations as is already specified in law and policy. Finding 11 demonstrated how using the first 20 days of ADM in determining a charter school's funded ADM can underrepresent membership, potentially causing a charter school to receive less funding due to student absences at the start of the school year. To mitigate this problem, the General Assembly should direct DPI to calculate charter school funding ADM based upon the higher of the first or second month ADM but not to exceed a charter school's final projected ADM that is submitted to DPI. In addition, DPI should define funded ADM for charter schools in the allotment policy manual and ensure that all DPI documents consistently define and describe the process of calculating funded ADM. Now altogether, these findings in this report show that the current allotment system is hampered by its complexity. It consists of numerous individual allotments that in some cases are redundant, counterintuitive, and may lack a clear rationale. Furthermore, allotment policies result in maldistribution of resources across LEAs and charter schools. And allotment system features and controls obfuscate transparency and accountability. Finally, we have shown another model for distributing resources that focuses on the student as the unit of funding that offers an alternative which merits serious consideration. Based on those findings, the General Assembly should choose between two options of either shifting to a more student-centric weighted student formula model or reforming the current system by addressing the deficiencies identified in this report. Now, as always, part of division protocol, agencies have the opportunity to respond to evaluation findings and recommendations. This response is included as part of this report. The Department of Public Instruction took exception with several of the report findings and recommendations. However, however, several of the points raised in the department's letter mischaracterizes portions of the report. As, re as a result, we felt it was necessary to clarify several points raised by DPI in its formal response, so we also prepared our own formal response to DPI's response. As members of this committee, you have two options. You may refer the report to any other committees, appropriate committees, or instruct staff to draft legislation based upon the report. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my presentation, and as always, I'm available to take questions at your direction.